let's see here. What am I doing? What am I doing here? Let's see. I'm doing present review. That's what we're doing. Okay. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. Let's uh let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll begin our discourse in the Ecclesiastes chapter two. Okay. Lord, thank you so much uh, just for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for just your word and and uh, who you are, your character, your nature, what you've revealed to us, and how this is uh, this can be used for us to leverage um, uh, information to give us proper perspective about uh, just the outlooks that are within the world and how to see things clearly. Pray, God, that this would be instructive and that uh, you would be glorified. Or it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, uh, talk about a review of what we talked about last week and uh, just the overall chapter uh, just itself, uh, chapter one of the book of Ecclesiastes. Oops, oh, that's, that's not good. What am I doing here? Okay. Um, last week, uh, we talked about uh, the faculty of coalesce activity in, in verse 12 of chapter 1. That uh, we talked about the word heart, right? And how it's not this, uh, this uh, physical muscle in the center of the chest, but that it's, it's really the immaterial, the, 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 the faculty of the spirit. It's usually translated as the mind, that place of understanding and thinking, comprehension, things like that. And Koaleth is uh, going to use his mind to observe these things under the sun. So he's not going to do this haphazardly. This is very purposeful. Okay? We talked about the source of authority of Koaleth which is found in verses 12 and 13, that's talking about the wisdom that he uses. And we had expressed that really the only wisdom is the wisdom that God has given. Anything else that is apart from the wisdom that God has given is not wisdom. It's something else, right? And so uh, uh, Koaleth is using his mind with the information that he has been given by God to examine the things under the sun. We talked about the method of Koaleth and his naturalistic observations that he has seen all of the activity or all of the works of men, right? That is um, um, kind of the method that he uses, right? So he's not kind of pontificating or theorizing like in a broom. This is, he's looking at the activities and the deeds of men and coming up with these conclusions based upon the wisdom that he's been given. And the consideration of insanity and foolishness. We talked about these words here and what they mean in the Hebrew scriptures, that insanity, um, that term is basically to talk about the thinking of an individual, that that person who thinks this way is irrational. They're not reasonable. Okay? They, are, they are not living in reality. And foolishness could perhaps underscore one's motives, right? That if one does things, but does things with the wrong motives, they are very foolish. And then the paradoxical realization of wisdom in verse 18, that wisdom is good because it gives us insight into life itself. However, uh, Kohalath, says that when one has more wisdom, the more they see things as they are and the more it becomes painful emotionally, right? Cognitively, right? Because we see that things are not well under the sun. Okay, so Koaleth ends the chapter, that is chapter one, telling the congregation his conclusion and the method used to ascertain this information. The rest of the book that uh, of Ecclesiastes that Koaleth is going to go through is examining the different perspectives from chapter two all the way uh, to the end of the book and observing if they have an advantage. So he's going to give us all these perspectives and then tell us 
whether or not they have an advantage or a profit or not. Okay. And of course, if you've read these things, you realize that most of these particular perspectives that he brings up in comparison to the wisdom that he has fall short. Let's go ahead and look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. By the way, we're not going to get very far on this one. And just to kind of let you know, um, we're probably just going to look at this verse and verse 2, and that's it for this morning. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. Again, uh, this word highlighted in red is the word lev. Again, as we mentioned in chapter one, Koaleth is informing the congregation of Israel concerning the thoughts from his mind. He's saying this to himself. Hey, come now. I'm going to test myself with these things. Underscoring again that this is an intentional exercise of Solomon. Okay. Let's take a look at another word here in red. The word here is test. So he says to himself or to in, or within his mind, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself and behold you to its futility. Nasa is the word here. Um, <laughs> freaking well. My goodness. Um, this word occurs 36 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. This word occurs in the book of Ecclesiastes twice. So it's not frequently used, but it is uh, used strategically um, one other time in this place in the book of Ecclesiastes. This book is a verb, right? So we're talking about an action here um, by Solomon. And its first usage of this word is not in the book of Ecclesiastes. It is in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 1, where it's talking about God testing Abraham with Isaac. Okay. We see it also used in various places, Nasa, with God and the nation of Israel, when he's uh, examining them out in the wilderness or testing them out in the wilderness in uh, Exodus 15. It is used of David concerning his faithfulness to God in light of his character. As a matter of fact, turn there to uh, Psalm 26 right quick. I want to take a look at that one. <clears throat> Psalm 26, verse 2. I'll start at verse 1 at the top. It says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. Very interesting there, because those are the same words uh, that Solomon is using here, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I do not sit with the de with deceitful men, nor do I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord. So in light of his character, he's telling God to examine him and see whether or not his character is wanting or lacking um, in terms of his conduct and what he believes. It is also used of Daniel and his kinsmen when they are uh, within the uh, captivity in Babylon, right? Um, and uh, no, this is not a diet plan, okay? Daniel had asked them to, uh, you know, he didn't want to uh, resort to eating the king's delicacies, right? As a, as kind of a, um, a check mark, if you will, or a highlight that uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's God is the true God. So he says, no, I don't want any of your delicacies. Um, he's not, he wasn't doing it to lose weight, okay, or to, uh, or, or to reduce his calorie intake, okay? This was simply an expression of 
Daniel's faithfulness to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I'll eat only vegetables. And then at the end of this, we'll see whether or not you're, you know, I'm healthy and, you know, and, uh, and things like that. So uh, this is used of Daniel and his kinsmen to be examined concerning the food that they would eat in Babylon as a, as a testimony or a witness to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So why would Solomon use this word here, or Kohalath, really? This word that he uses is to underscore the intent of this exercise. Really, in reality, Solomon is using this to see whether the subject or the issue that he's getting ready to address in chapter 2 and onward is valid or authentic, right? Again, remember the question. What advantage is there for all the labor that profits under the sun, right? He's going to see if there's any worth or value in these areas or this activity. That is the reason. Okay. Are these things worth their weight in gold? Is it worth the salt, right? Remember, again, in verse 1, the purpose statement that vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He's going to prove this or demonstrate this. And the summation of Koalath's findings in verse 14 and also verse 2 and 3. So this word is used again to underscore the fact that he's going to see if, this, if these things have authenticity or weight to them. If they have value. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, verse 1, so enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. Again, let's look at this word that's highlighted in red on the screen, pleasure. The, the Hebrew word is simcha. Okay? This word occurs 94 times in the, Greek, in the Hebrew scriptures, excuse me, and this word occurs eight times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay. This is a noun in the Hebrew language, so it's a person or place or thing. It is not a an, an activity, um, and this word can be used to describe a person's physiological response to something. Um, it's used in various different ways. Okay. So if one is jovial, right? Uh, or if one has um, is very celebratory, you can use that to describe this word here, simcha. Okay. So if we were to throw a party, or if there's a wedding, or something like that, and people are enjoying themselves, right, and uh, interacting very pleasantly, this would be a word that could be used here in this text. This word can also be used to describe a person who has a favorable disposition or attitudes towards something or someone, right? Which Psalm chapter 4, verse 7, or Psalm 4, verse 7, is, uh, is an example of this, right? Or being pleasurable. Now, we talked about the Septuagint before. Uh, it is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. It is not inspired, but it's interesting to see some of the words that are used within this text, right? Because we can take some of the words that uh, the, tr the translators of the, um, of the Septuagint uh, used and then compare those to the, to the Greek scriptures and see how they're used. The Greek word here that's used in the Septuagint is the word euphorosyne which is, if you notice the prefix, so the root of the word here, this is where we get the word euphoria. Okay. There's a very interesting usage of this word in the Greek scriptures. If you could please turn to the book of Acts, chapter 14. It's kind of fascinating. Book of Acts, the historical account of the uh, of the work of the apostles by means of the Holy Spirit to 
to lay down the foundation um, of the gospel throughout the known world at that time. This is uh, in chapter 14. This involves um, 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 Paul and some of the workers that Paul was, uh, was, was with. Um, and it's interesting because Paul and them are doing kind of some miraculous works within the, uh, within the region of Lystra, and they want to make uh, Paul and his workers gods. They want to exalt them because of some of the works that they're doing. And, uh, and uh, Paul uh, and them issue a very swift rebuke. And we find this rebuke here in, uh, at the start of verse 15. It says, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to serve a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without a witness and that he did good and gave you rains. Hey, wonderful. Considering this morning from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. That word gladness is the same Greek word that's used here. You for signing. Okay. In other words, satisfaction with food and being content with those things, right? All of these things, we, the, the, the source of these things is God who made the earth and the sea and all that is in them, right? So simcha, the Greek word euphrosyne, refers, when it comes to koaleth, a constant personal satisfaction in life. That's pleasure, right? Do these things, that is, these things he's going to describe, can they give consistent personal satisfaction in life? Again, going back to verse 1, his mind is set, purposeful, to figure this out, to examine, to see whether or not these things can give personal satisfaction in life. Can we live for them? Again, this goes back to the purpose statement, the purpose question, and the summation of coalesce finding. This will all, we're always going to point ourselves here because this is this is the question, right? What advantage or what profit does man have in all of his work which he toils under the sun? This is this is the point here. So we're always going to go back to that. Okay. So can I so can Koaleth find satisfaction in the activities that he's thinking about? So come now, I will test you with pleasure or consistent satisfaction. So enjoy yourself, and behold, you behold it too was futility. Enjoy yourself is the translation here in my Greek, uh, in my Hebrew text. But let's look at these words a little closely here. Enjoy, ra'ah, is this word here, ra'ah. It occurs 30, over 1,300 times in the Hebrew scriptures, okay, so it's frequent. And the first usage of this word is found at the start of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 4, okay, where the Lord saw that things were good. Okay. This word, ra'ah, is used in the book of Ecclesiastes 47 times. That's a lot. So this is a main a main topic within this book itself. Okay? The first usage of this word is in verse 8. Okay? It goes, all things are worrisome. Man is not able to tell. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. 
that word seeing is this word here, ra'ah. Really kind of interesting that it's translated to enjoy, right? When it's translated as to see in other places. We'll talk about that in a minute. This word is in, is in the active qual in the mind of Koalath. So it's so he's this is again this is a purposeful exercise here that he's going to go and do and again this origin is found in the mind of Koalath as he's thinking this The word in the Hebrew scriptures that is ra'ah is overwhelmingly used to it underscore intense consideration attention to actively focus on something or someone else's activity and considering the quality. Think about how it's used in Genesis 1-4. The Lord saw that it was good. He examined it and came to the, this is good. This is a good thing here. It is used overwhelmingly in that sense. It's not just looking at something and going, okay, I see this here. It's looking at something and going, oh, that that's good. It's like an inspection. As a matter of fact, um, tob is the next word here. Now, you cannot see it within the, the English, but in the Hebrew, it's as clear as a bell. Okay? This word occurs 565 times in the Hebrew scriptures. This word is used in the book of Ecclesiastes 52 times. It is the third book that this word is most frequently used. Okay? So again, this is another main consideration of Koalath as he's examining these things in this book. Again, this word can be used as a noun or an adjective, depending on the context that is being used here. Okay. And since it, it can be used in this sense as a word, uh, as an adjective or a noun, it is frequently used to describe either the quality of a thing or the quality of a person. Either this thing is good or this person is. We find this usage of the word here in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was with form and was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. That word there is to. Okay? The quality of a thing that the light itself was good because God created it. So. Probably a more accurate uh, uh, translation is not enjoy yourself, but consider. Consider with goodness or consider goodness. That's really what it is. Or consider the good. Koheleth thought he needed to consider the quality of goodness that pleasure, that is the content satisfaction of something, would bring him. And what would be the outcome of this? Okay. Now, by the way, this is not a new uh, concept. Of course, we're reading the scriptures, God's inspired word and bringing this out. But this is something that humanity has always pondered. This isn't a new thing. It's time to take our first detour. Our first detour. Now, now, what's interesting is, is that Solomon, we translate it as pleasure. It is simcha, personal satisfaction. But in our culture, it, we have uh, attributed another name to this. And that name is hedonism. Not heathenism. Okay. Hedonism. Okay. What's kind of interesting is the word hedonism is a Greek word. It is a Greek word that comes from, it's translated hedone, which means pleasure. Isn't that fascinating? Of course, when you add an ism 
to the end of any word that is a noun, it heightens it. It becomes a comprehensive set of beliefs. It becomes a worldview. Okay. So hedonism isn't just the belief of, of, of pleasure. It is a worldview. It becomes a comprehensive set of beliefs that one aligns their thoughts and their activity to. Okay. Whenever you see the word ism in anything, humanism, spiritualism, you know, biblicism, any type of ism, it is a worldview. Okay. Hedonism, as we commonly understand it, that is not, not us in this room, but just the world at large in our modern time, underscores various theories about what is good for humanity, how we ought to behave, and the motivation to behave in the way humans do. Notice it's talking about the benefit of humanity and the motivation of humanity and how the thoughts or the motivations align with how one conducts themselves. It's not just about the actions. It is about the thought behind the actions, too. Hedonism, or pleasurism, recognizes pleasure and pain as the two qualities that constitute the value of a human being. Let's go into some of the thought processes of hedonism as a worldview because there are different types. Okay? First, we have what's known as folk hedonism. Now, I, I, I can talk about this all day. I, you, know, you know, Will and I, we go back. And forth. I'm, a, I'm a philosophy guy. I love logic. I love philosophy. I love it. I understand that there may be some out, some of you who may not be as as affectionate to this to this to this particular subject as I am. But I think it's important for us in our discourse. Remember I told you Ecclesiastes is a philosophical book. So we have to at least um be willing to explore some of these concepts. Okay? Okay, let's talk about one, um, one aspect of hedonism, and that is folk hedonism. When we talk about folk hedonism, this is usually what we talk about, okay, um, when we are kind of conversing in our, in, you know, and talking um, in everyday language. This is those who seek out self-pleasure without any regard for the future or well-being. They just live it up, okay? That's all they do. They just live it up. They want the feels all the time, right? They have no concern for themselves, for their personal well-being, or the, or the well-being of others. They're not even thinking about the consequences. They're just living it up, right? This is the most common belief of hedonism among those who are in the world, but this really isn't what hedonism is per se, okay? That's hence the term folk hedonism. Right? What we're taught usually talking about is usually two, two, two types of hedonism. One is what's known as value hedonism. What is value hedonism? It is the basic understanding that pleasure in itself is intrinsically valuable. The concept or the thought of or the abstract concept, the idea of pleasure in and of itself is a value to us as human beings. Okay? Whereas pain is invaluable. It doesn't, it's not worth anything, right? Money in this particular aspect of hedonism is not a, a intrinsically valuable because money can lose value, right? However, what we can attain or acquire through money, that is what brings pleasure. So if we can purchase homes, we can purchase foods, we can purchase status items like cars and boats and yachts 
and things like that. Those things give us pleasure. It's not the money in and of itself, according to value hedonism. It is the goods that we can purchase with the money that gives us pleasure. Okay? And of course, avoiding pain in the process. Okay? That's value hedonism. So collecting, collecting goods and things like that is what can give us value or using instrumental value to purchase things of value um, is important according to this particular perspective. Then we have what's known as prudential hedonism. You didn't think there was just one, there was just one type. There's a whole bunch of these thought processes out here, right? Everybody's everybody's talking about something. What is prudential hedonism? Prudential hedonism is the basic understanding that all and only pleasure intrinsically makes human beings' lives good for them, right? And all and only intrinsic pain makes life worse for human beings, right? They believe that the prevalence of pleasure, they believe... Uh, that that pleasure uh, it should be more prevalent than pain. Now, a lot of these people mistake folk hedonism for these individuals. But the problem is, is that prudential hedonists don't think that living it up is beneficial, right? Whereas folk hedonists do. Prudential hedonism believes in the long game. That you that you want to attain pleasure not in the short term but in the long term, okay? That's the difference between those who are prudential and those who are folk hedonists. Now, let's go to the most common one that everyone talks about as well. So we have folk hedonism, which is more common, and then we have motivational hedonism. This is the most common one that we talk about, too, as well, especially within areas of academia and various places. Motivational hedonism is the basic understanding of human beings' conduct is guided by enhancing pleasure and avoiding pain. This has to do with our motivation. The reason why we do and choose the things that we do is because we are trying to enhance our satisfaction or our pleasure in our lives, and we're trying to avoid pain. This is our motivation. Even altruistic activities, the fact that we give money to, the, to uh, worthy causes, according to motivational hedonists, we do this not because it benefits them, but because it gives us pleasure. It makes us feel good, right? Which includes conscious and unconscious states. You would be surprised at the individuals throughout history that have promoted this viewpoint. Some of the proponents include Epicurus, a Greek philosopher, William James, who is the creator of pragmatism, we do things because they work and for the sake of their goodness. Sigmund Freud, his entire psychoanalytic theory is about this. John Stuart Mill, we'll talk about him later on. He'll come up later on. Utilitarian thought and possibly Charlie Darwin. These are the kind of the bright lights, quote unquote, of some of the uh, some of the ideas within the West and Western culture. Again, hedonism that is motivational hedonism has been at the heart of some of the teachings and things that we've been we've uh, been exposed to and been familiar with. But it doesn't stop there. We've got more. Normative hedonism <clears throat> is the next one. This is known as ethical hedonism. So you've got folk hedonism, value hedonism, prudential hedonism, motivational hedonism, and ethical hedonism. This is the basic understanding that in order to achieve happiness, 
Pleasure ought to be pursued and pain ought to be avoided. When you seek things that are pleasurable, you are doing a morally or ethically good thing. It's not just an activity that benefits you. It is now an ethic. It is ethically right to do so. There are two types of normative hedonism or ethical hedonism. That is hedonistic egoism and hedonistic utilitarianism. We're, we're, we're in the thick of it now. It's too late to, it's too late to, it's too late to leave this rabbit hole. Let's continue. Hedonistic egoism or hedonistic egoism is the basic understanding that a person or even a society ought to do whatever makes them happiness that provides the most pleasure after pain is extracted. The problem with this theory that most people find is that it doesn't give intrinsic qualities to things like justice. Justice becomes, well, whatever the society finds pleasurable, let's go and do that, right? There's no intrinsic qualities to justice, love, friendship, loyalty, things like that. These things are not intrinsic in and of themselves. It's just whatever the society deems what brings the most pleasure. Hence, it is unfavorable of all of the theories. Hedonistic egoism. Second is hedonistic utilitarianism. It is the basic understanding that a right action is an action that a person or society generates. Okay? That, has, that provides the greatest quality of happiness of all people. In this perspective, it, it basically has the same problems that hedonistic egoism has. There's no intrinsic value in any of the things that, that the society or the individual seeks to adopt. They're just doing it because they believe it promotes happiness. So untruth can become a value if that society deems that it brings them happiness, right? Injustice could be by design a a thing that a society promotes if it brings them happiness. Just look at Chaz, right? And up in Washington State. So, what do all of these have in common? There's a lot of them up here, right? But underscoring them again, let's not let's not under on, under all the weeds and all the confusion and all of these things. The two things that these things have in common is that pleasure is the central focal point of all of these, right? And is pleasure a human? value should we pursue it for the sake of itself right that's what all of these things have in common is pleasure the highest quality a human should pursue in life is this the purpose for why we were made that is the question and that's the question that solomon is seeking to answer purposefully A shorter alternative question, really, that seeks to understand this is why are, why are we here? That's really, that's really the, the question. What, why do we exist? Do we just exist for pleasure's sake? It's the assertion of the question of existence. Why we exist? We had to take this detour to show you that really Solomon by the wisdom of God is really bringing up something that mankind will continue to think about even after we are long gone. Humankind will still continue to ponder this. Why am I here? 
Am I here for pleasure? Is this why I'm here? Right? Now, back to Ecclesiastes now. Let's continue to examine this particular text here. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. And behold, it too was futility. I find this to be an interesting statement because usually you ask a question, you do your research, and then you offer the conclusion. Well, Solomon just, he, he pulls no punches. He just, you know, I'll just give you the conclusion right now. Um, it's useless, right? Kohaleth informs his audience whom he is addressing and gives his thoughts about thinking and activity while he's thinking about this with the term behold. Look, pay attention, focus, behold. I want you to get this. It too, that is the pleasure, is futility, havel. We recognize this word. This is the word that's used. In verse 2 of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Vanity of vanities, all has vanity. Havel, it is, it is a vapor. It's here and gone. All right? So it would, would appear, according to Koaleth, that pleasure, for the sake of it, is empty. It doesn't last very long. Whether, you, whether one is a folk hedonist, the motivational hedonist, ego utilitarian hedonist, doesn't matter what type of hedonist they are. If they're pursuing their life for the sake of personal satisfaction, they're going to wind up empty, like sand in the hand or chasing after the wind, right? Trying to grab it with your hand. It's not going to last long. There are some questions that we have to answer throughout chapter two. The first one is, what does the following statement about laughter mean? He says this in verse two. He said, I said of laughter, it is madness. That word madness is the same word that's used. It is irrational. Is he just saying that laughter is irrational? Are we just all supposed to be walking around stoic all the time? Not laughing about stuff? That would be, that'd be kind of, is, is Solomon really saying that? Hmm. And a pleasure, what does it accomplish? What, what, is, what does this mean, laughter? What, is it, what does the following statement about laughter mean in relation to this context here? What was his activity and why does he come to these conclusions? This is the chapter two onward. What is the activity that he conducted himself? If we had never read this book before and we came to this, this statement that he made, this would, be a, this would be a natural question. What did he do, right? How did he come to this conclusion? What, what activities did he do, right? And the last one, does Koalath believe that pleasure is bad? Is it a bad thing? Should we be living in huts uh, with mud tarps? right? And things like that, right? Should we not acquire nice things, right? We will answer these questions in relation to our subject next week. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will, uh, we will end our discourse in the Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Lord, thank you so much that your word addresses really what we all think and what we've all pondered, just like Solomon. Why are we here? What is the purpose of our living here? Why do we exist? Why, are, why were we created? And I thank you, Lord, that Kohalath, that is Solomon, pulls no punches. He gives it to us straight and that uh, we would see things as they are so that we come to the ultimate conclusion that he puts at the end of his discourse. We thank you so much, Lord, for who you are and for what you do. 
May we continue to ponder and think about these things that you have revealed to us by way of Koalath in your word. For it's in your son's name. Amen. Yes, my name is Jesus.